I think most people are, are return uh, webinar attendees, um, but maybe not. So uh, this is our last and final uh, social finance uh, webinar uh, for Ethical Environmental Everyone. Um, so on these speaker series, we've been hosting uh, experts in impact investing, social finance, and social entrepreneurship, uh, primarily from non-Canadian uh, non funds. Um, so we had the last four sessions be, be funds from the U.S., and Europe, um, kind of exploring different models they were using, um, options of different products they were providing to, to uh, um, agriculture uh, producers and retailers and processors, so across the agriculture value chain. And um, we learned a lot of uh, many different interesting things, like last week, uh, we explored the crop trust model, which was uh, an innovative financing mechanism to support the seed banks globally, which was really neat. Um, and so on this session for this week, we're taking a different spin and we actually welcomed uh, two, two speakers from uh, Canada uh, to speak about uh, their models because they're quite innovative and I don't think uh, spoken about enough. Um, so today we have uh, Eugene Elliman, who is a uh, chair on Fair Trade Canada, and he'll talk about Fair Trade Canada's activities uh, within the social finance space. And then we have Paul Lecomte, uh, Director General of La Fira, which is a fund in Quebec that provides uh, financing to agriculture producers in a couple different forms. Um, so before we get started, I will go ahead and uh, do the land acknowledgement, and then I will talk a little bit more about the organizations and introduce Eugene, who will be our first speaker. So I'll begin this event by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, as we gather here, there have been Aboriginal peoples who have been stewards of this place. In particular, I acknowledge the traditional territory of the Atawandan, Atishnabe, and Hadassane's peoples. This treaty is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. We recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection to this place. And we also recognize the contributions of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular and our province and country as a whole. We'd also like to acknowledge that as we function virtually, especially this year, we're relying on resources drawn from Native and formerly Native land to run our computers, lights, heats, and virtual connections we have all come to depend on. Okay, so uh, Fair Trade Canada is the Canadian branch of Fair Trade International which works to secure better prices, working conditions, and fair trade for farmers and workers in developing countries. Fair trade advocates, uh, sorry, fair trade advocate, uh, advocates <laughs> for thriving farmer and worker communities that have more control over their futures. They stand in solidarity with producer organizations without compromise to their standards, prices, or vision to make trade work for everyone along the supply chain. Then La Fiera, uh, is a private company that supports the next generation and access to agriculture. The fund was established by the government of Quebec, the Sol Sol Solidarity Fund QFL, and Capital Regionale et Cooperatif des Jardins. They joined forces in 2011 to create the investment fund for agricultural succession. Through the respective contribution of 25 million to this fund, so 75 million in total, these partners support the development of agriculture in Quebec by supporting the sustainability of our agriculture businesses and incurring a new generation to take over. Our first speaker, Eugene, uh, is retired from the sustainable investment industry uh, two years ago, so in February 2019, after working in the sector for 20 years. He devotes his time currently to uh, volunteer pursuits and research and writing on sustainable business and finance. Prior to his retirement, Eugene served for six years with Oikel Credit International. Um, if you guys haven't heard about them, they're a leading impact investor in developing countries, and he had up uh, Oikel's credit capital raising operations in Canada and the U.S. Prior to that, he was the executive director for 13 years of Social Investment Organization, which is now called the Responsible Investment Association, so RIA Canada, which probably everyone has heard of and knows, so it's very exciting to hear all about Eugene's uh, support and success in, in launching uh, that organization for 13 years and playing a creative uh, key role in establishing the organization. 
Uh, he has written extensively on sustainable finance, so follow him on LinkedIn. He'll publish the articles he writes and is a recipient of Excellence in uh, Corporate Responsibility Award and SIO Distinguished Service Award. Thank you, Eugene, for attending today, and I'll let you take it over. Thanks, Chelsea, for the introduction and, and the kind words. I'll uh, just share my screen here. Is that, uh, can you see that? I... Not yet. Oh. Yep. Not yet. Here, try once more and then it should work. There we go. It's coming up now. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the invitation to, to speak to you today uh, and my work with uh, in the international development sector and in impact investing in Canada, I've come to realize that agriculture is absolutely fundamental to um, some of the meeting some of the world's greatest challenges, such as poverty alleviation and, and climate change. So, um, so in addition to my work now with uh, Fair Trade Canada, I'm on the chair of the board of directors. There, I'm also a volunteer with Fair Finance Fund, and I sit on their on their loan review committee. So I'm Really pleased uh, to be here today to talk a little bit about uh, both agricultural development from the international perspective and also also the local perspective. Now, I should say that Fair Trade Canada isn't primarily a, a social finance organization. Uh, social finance is not core to to the activities of what Fair Trade Canada does. It's a, it facilitates trade on on fair terms between producers in the global south and consumers in the global north in, in affiliation with Fair Trade International. Um, but there are some social finance aspects to what we do and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But today I'm prim primarily going to talk about our, uh, what we do uh, to uh, facilitate trade on fair terms. So a little bit about the international fair trade system. Um, we very much are a, um, a triple bottom line uh, movement. We, uh, we are working to create fair terms of trade uh, from both an economic point of view, a social point of view, and an environmental point of view. And uh, we do this through uh, four um, key elements. Uh, one is establishing a minimum price for, uh, for fair trade producers around the world. And that minimum price is set uh, in a process which establishes the uh, basic cost of production of producers for various commodities in various regions of the world. And then it establishes that as the minimum price that those producers will receive for their commodity. And uh, companies or consumers buying fair trade products then agree to, agree to a a price for their commodity that includes that minimum price. In addition to that, uh, fair trade also establishes a fair trade premium, which is a, an additional uh, benefit that goes to the producers that is um, at the discretion of those producers to, to use as they see fit. So in some cases, the organizations that represent the producers use it for uh, local community projects, uh, education, health, or, um, or community development, or in some cases it's used to, uh, for training purposes and to increase competitiveness and innovation um, um, for the, by the producers themselves. Fair trade also includes um, social and environmental standards, um, a, a series of standards uh, that um, involve issues such as uh, human rights, uh, gender relations, uh, workplace uh, health and safety, um, and environmental considerations. And in, in particular, recently, uh, climate change mitigation 
to enable producers to develop their, uh, their, their processes and their crops in a way that um, mitigates the effects of climate change. And then fourthly, we also uh, have uh, producers, uh, we also have programs specifically run by the producer networks themselves um, for in addition uh, to, uh, to the fair trade standards and premiums, these are uh, additional programs that are paid for out of the license fees that, uh, that retailers pay uh, us to, uh, to use the fair trade mark logo. So the, uh, the key, the key uh, commodities that fair trade is involved with, uh, and this is in Canada and around the world is coffee, cocoa, bananas, sugar, cotton, flowers, and tea. There are other commodities as well, um, such as jewelry and um, fair trade um, uh, clothing. Um, and in Canada, I'm pleased to say that uh, fair trade wine is uh, becoming more more common in in, uh, in Ontario and in some of the other provinces, but these essentially are the uh, the key commodities that that the fair trade system is organized around. So, if you just to give you a sense of the scale of fair trade around the world, um, in our most recent figures is that there's almost 14 billion dollars in estimated sales of fair trade products around the world. Um, and these are produced by 1.7 billion farmers and workers in, uh, in 75 countries uh, around the world. The, uh, the amount of premium, the amount of additional funding that goes beyond the minimum price is about 270 million. And that's distributed to the producers and their organizations. Uh, 1,600 producer and worker organizations are involved in fair trade around the world. And the one thing that we're very proud of in the fair trade movement, um, which is which differentiates us from many of the other consumer labels, such as Rainforest Alliance, for example, is that we truly are a 50-50 partnership between producers in the global south and consumer organizations in the global north. And this is reflected in the General Assembly meeting, which is our annual um, key governance meeting of the fair trade system, where uh, half of the votes go to producer organizations uh, in developing countries and half of the votes go to consumer organizations in the north. So this gives you a sense of some of the uh, community impacts that fair trade has had around the world. Um, you can see that it involves things like biodiversity projects, um, technical assistance and innovation um, uh, improvements for the, the producers themselves, soil conservation, uh, health, uh, and this is just a small, just a small snapshot of uh, of the the community benefits that flow to producers in the fair trade system around the world. Uh, just a few words about the minimum price, which is really key to the economic benefit of fair trade. So if you look at coffee um, production, for example, or coffee prices, rather, you can see the this uh, graph shows the um, amount of money that actually goes to the producers for the basic uh, for a basic pound of coffee. So you can see the black line below uh, the volatile line. It goes up and down, but essentially it hovers around. Recently, it has hovered around a dollar twenty a pound. Uh, for for basic coffee uh, sold at uh, sold by farmers and producer organizations, so the fair trade minimum you can see is a dollar forty, so that's somewhat above above that. If you take into account the minimum price and then the fair trade premium, that brings that up to a dollar sixty, and uh, and then if you include the fair trade premium plus plus an additional organic premium from various organic labels that brings that up to uh, over $1.80. So you can see that uh, the benefit to the producer is, is significant. Now we believe that it's still not high enough because the minimum price is still a function of the cost of production of producers. And it doesn't really reflect what the cost of living is for those producers. So, Increasingly, what the fair trade system is moving to a, 
to an arrangement where we are going to be looking at how much can we set as a price that will pro provide a living wage um, to the producers or the workers that actually produce the product. So we have several projects around the world now um, led by uh, our, our um, COCO affiliate in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, which has now established a, a living wage minimum price for cocoa for those producers. And our aim internationally is to move this uh, to all of our commodities around the world. Um, in Canada, uh, we are the, uh, so I'm the chair of the uh, board of Fairtrade Canada. We are the Canadian affiliate of the Fairtrade International System. In uh, 2019, we uh, generated, or rather we didn't, but our licensees um, generated 606 million in fair trade sales, and that was up 21% in 2019. Um, and in terms of the premium that, that flowed back to the producers, we generated 6.8 million, and that was up 13%. So uh, we, uh, Fair Trade Canada receives, it's a, um, it's a nonprofit organization, but it's, it's a commercial oriented nonprofit. Uh, we derive most of our income from our license fees that we charge to uh, retailers, wholesalers that uh, um, deal in fair trade products um, and are licensed by us to use the fair trade label. So 35% of those license fees go back to the producer system, in, back to the three producer networks in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And 65% of those fees are retained in Canada to uh, help help us with our, our public um, awareness programs and um, and our efforts to uh, develop trust and uh, knowledge about the fair trade label. So on that topic, uh, you can see that uh, um, this is based on some surveys that we do from time to time through Leger and Leger, uh, we, we uh, contract with them to measure consumer awareness of the fair trade label. And these are the results from the last uh, survey, which was done fairly recently. So you can see that there's 80% uh, of Canadians, uh, Canadian consumers, believe that there's a strong resonance with the idea of supporting farmers and ensuring fair pay. However, that is offset with also um, some consideration for price. In terms of awareness, 90% of, of consumers are aware of the fair trade label um, and 58% uh, say that they're familiar with them. Um, of those people that are aware, 57% have purchased fair trade products in the past six months. And uh, in, if you look at purchases within the last year, 68% purchased within the last year. So um, the, uh, and 47% are, are uh, likely to make a purchase in the future. So um, you can see that our awareness building activity is, is crucial to um, making sure that uh, a growing numbers of Canadians are aware of the fair, fair trade label. And then once aware are prepared to, to uh, buy products under the fair trade label. So just turning a little bit to, to uh, social finance, uh, as I mentioned before, we're not primarily a social finance organization. Um, we, we are a trade facilitation organization, but uh, uh, we have had some affiliation with um, a fund on the international level with a fund called the Fair Trade Access Fund, which has been going for about 10 years now. And it was a partnership of Fair Trade International and Incofin Investment Management group of Belgium, which is a, uh, a large uh, socially responsible asset manager. And they established this uh, basically to set up um, an institutional investment fund that would provide um, um, inventory uh, capital, working capital, and um, uh, growth capital for primarily our producer organizations um, in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And then as well, over the last 10 years, they've also expanded to microfinance institutions that, that are, are involved in fair trade. 
So um, in over the 10 years, uh, there's been $128 million dispersed to, uh, to fair trade producer organizations and to microfinance institutions in 19 countries in Latin America and Africa involving our basic crops, as I mentioned before. And, um, and this has uh, produced a return on investment in, uh, in, in 2019 of 3% for investors. Not a huge return, but um, we believe that it's a fair return um, for, the, for the social impact that, uh, that has been generated. And of course, recently that has to be kept in mind that uh, investment returns for income uh, investors in bonds and uh, fixed income investments have been relatively low over the last few years. So considering both the in impact and that 3% return, that seems to be a return that uh, investors are, social mission-based investors are pleased with. Uh, in Canada, we haven't had a lot of examples of, of social finance involving fair trade, but we have had some. Uh, Planet Bean is one of our licensees, coffee licensees uh, based in Guelph. Uh, they're a coffee roaster that uh, uh, supplies cafes and uh, uh, cafes in the Guelph area and grocery stores across, across Canada, actually. And um, they have had uh, a community bond on offer for many years. They, they currently don't have a bond on offer right now, but uh, they have had a community bond that is linked to their um, their corporate structure, which is a co-op, which is a worker-owned co-op. So in Ontario and some of the other provinces, um, it is possible for co-ops to issue their own capital without onerous prospective arrangements. So Planet Bean has done this in the last few years. Uh, you may also be familiar with Camino, uh, which is a, a large fair trade um, chocolate producer uh, based out of La Siembra Co-op in Ottawa. And they currently have uh, both preferred shares and debentures uh, on offer. And to date, uh, over the last few years, they have raised uh, over a million dollars through their preferred shares. Uh, we'd be interested in seeing more of these kinds of experiments, um, but uh, the uh, the capital raising regulations in Ontario and in other provinces are, are quite onerous. Uh, the licensees that are organized as co-ops have some uh, advantages that, uh, that um, small businesses, just conventional small businesses don't have, but uh, we'd certainly like to see more of this activity um, to help not just our licensees, but to provide avenues for fair trade consumers to also use their investment dollars for this. So I'll, uh, I'll wrap up shortly. Um, uh, we hope that uh, you look for your fair trade uh, logo and among your, your local retailers. And um, in, um, to make it easier, uh, the Fair Trade Canada website does have a list of local retailers at uh, local.fairtrade.ca uh, slash en and then slash or slash fr. And uh, that'll provide a listing of, of fair trade retailers across Canada. So um, that's it. And I would be happy to uh, answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Eugene. I think that was a, I think that's a really interesting spin on uh, the majority of topics that we've had today. Um, Cause I think as you mentioned, finance is, is essential for trade. And uh, I think I have a few questions for you about the, uh, the Fair Trade Access Fund and, and their success and, and um, how they measure their success as well. Uh, but we'll leave that for the Q&A. And as I mentioned, Lafir will be presenting next. Uh, so Paul Lacomte is here, who's the general director. Um, I'll just introduce him quickly. So we have, uh, Paul has a degree uh, from Laval University and is a member of the Quebec Order of Agronomists. He started his career in the fruit and vegetable trade in the late 80s, worked in economic development as well as in, in the environment before starting his career in agriculture and agri-food financial world at the, end of the, at the end of the 90s. First, he started at Farm Credit Canada. He worked his way up from farm account manager to major agri-food accounts, and he continued managing positions, first by managing the agriculture markets for Desjardins Financial Centre of the Côte du Sud, 
uh, followed by managing business development for Deja Den uh, Financial Center, Biken Kaur, uh, Nicolette Yamasaka. Uh, in 2011, he took part in the implementation of the uh, of the FIRA, so Fonds d'Investment pour Revelé Agricole, uh, investment for young agriculture entrepreneurs, and have managed it ever since as chief officer. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining. Um, you know how excited I already am <laughs> to hear you talk more about this. Um, and we'll be sharing, obviously, the recordings widely as well. So thank you for coming today. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first, I would like to apologize for my level of English. Uh, I'm not so good. I don't speak English very often. I'll do my best. And if, I, if you need more explanation, let me know at the end. I'll, I'll try to uh, say it another way to make sure that uh, it's understood. Uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, FIRA. Uh, it's the, uh, oh, sorry, I will share the uh, presentation as well. Uh, you can see the presentation right now. Jessica, thanks. Uh, the the uh, Investment Fund for Young Agricultural Entrepreneurs, uh, which I called FIA, I'm sorry if I, I use the French word, uh, was created about 10 years ago. Uh, let me start and give you, uh, sorry, little problem. Of, Okay, I have to bring you back a little bit in the context of FIRA 10 years ago, how uh, agriculture was going at that time. Uh, we had a, an urge to help uh, young producers. Problem was at that time, we're coming out of the crisis of 2008. Um, this crisis made that all in financial institutions were quite lukewarm to uh, make loan to young producers or startups. So at that time, we found out that it was time to look at solutions and together uh, we, uh, we put this fund uh, up to, uh, to, to answer those problems. Barrier to entries at that time, uh, as you know, to start a farm, uh, even the smallest dairy farm can cost up to $2 million. So for somebody who's just coming out of school, uh, it's pretty hard to have the, mi the minimum cash down to put on such such an, such an amount for, uh, for cash down to, to put on your project. So merely anybody was able to start uh, at very young age in agriculture in Quebec anymore. And it's not only in Quebec, I would say it's, uh, it's broader than that. Cost of the, act of the assets are so high, especially land. And by the way, with a prior presentation we had in the previous week, uh, we had the queue on the, the price of the land either in the United States, in Canada, and let me say that in Quebec, uh, the, 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 the trend is a little bit uh, better. The land is a little bit at higher price right now than it is everywhere, everywhere else uh, in North America, unfortunately. So it's a major barrier to entry for young people. Uh, also for young people, when they want to start in, in regions, uh, there's not a lot of services, financial services available. So they have to seek forward, closer to the, uh, the, the major center to find a way to uh, finance their project. 10 years ago, uh, there was very few subsidies available for young people to start. And those subsidies were only available for people who wanted to start at full time their, uh, their, their business. Unfortunately, in agriculture, cannot start uh, a regular business, a regular farm at the beginning because the price of the assets, like I said, is too high. And the final problem we had for young people in 2008, uh, support logistics, uh, all the services uh, for the, the young farmers were not available uh, all the time everywhere to help them to build up their startup or to finance their, uh, their the transfer to farm they, they were looking at. So 10 years ago, uh, the three partners had created the FIRA, a small laboratory to uh, better understand what was going on with young farmers, how we could help them. And we start this laboratory by proposing a few financial solutions. The three partners who are the government of Quebec uh, with the Financière Agricole du Québec, 
at Desjardins, which is a major uh, financial co-op here in Quebec. And uh, there are also in United States and in the uh, Western part of Canada right now, as well as the uh, Fonds de Solidarité, la FTQ. Those last two are pension funds, by the way. Uh, they joined together because each of them had a mission to help and support startups somehow, to help and support young people in their business development, and to invest wherever they could do uh, some uh, impact for uh, business development. So they joined together with e each $25 million uh, to create a fund called FIRA. So we are an independent organization from all those three, and we can work out with anybody on the market. 10 years ago, those three who had financial interest in the fund uh, add us also to look at uh, the social uh, viewpoint on this project. So we create an advisory committee. Uh, this advisory committee is mainly uh, uh, composed of a representative of the FIRA, as well as people from the uh, UPA, the uh, Farmers Union in Quebec. A little uh, blink of an eye is to that group. Especially in Quebec, this union is, uh, is, the, is the only union who represents the farmers, which was very important for us to have their input on the project and the way we were developing this laboratory that is FIRA. Uh, so we create an advisory committee to get their input in the way we were developing it. Uh, at the same time, like I said, we had two uh, investment funds who are putting money into it, though they didn't want to be directed by the farmer's opinion, but they wanted to make sure that what they were taking into account their opinion. So they create an advisory committee and not, uh, they didn't, sorry, and they didn't give them a uh, chair on the, uh, on the, on the board uh, at that time to respect their uh, sovereignty on the way they were developing the, the firearm. Mission, mission at that time, we, we had in mind to uh, create uh, some kind of financial support with a solution that were uh, adapted to young people, to young farm, to startups, and as well as to uh, make available some patient capital at that time. On the goal we had with that was to uh, help. Uh, 10 years ago, I didn't say it before, but uh, there was at least one farm which was closing every three days in Quebec. And we were seeing all those young people with talent who were not able to get into agriculture, though we want to stop this erosion of, uh, of the number of young farmers who are coming. Though we, we want to have some kind of influence on the number of new farmer uh, were coming uh, into farming. As well, we want to create opportunities uh, for supporting startup as well as uh, transfer by two young producers. Like I said, it's a huge laboratory. We wanted to demonstrate to other financial institutions that in getting involved with startups was, uh, was a goal that all the institution shall uh, support and keep, keep in mind to have because we saw that uh, those financial institutions were getting, uh, were, were lacking, of their, pre their, their present was lacking uh, to, beside the, the startups. I'm sorry. 75 millions was not enough to open this fund to everybody, though we created for young people. We define a little bit more what was this, the, the young people were uh, able to access this project. So we define that people from 18 to 29, 39 years old were uh, eligible to it. Unfortunately, uh, I'm finding out with time and that's one of the um, outcome of this uh, experiment we're doing with FIRA. Uh, we found out that people are starting their farms uh, older and older right now, though the average age was roughly around 28, 10 years ago. And now we can observe that the average age of startups or transfer is more between 32 and 33. So we shall adapt uh, this concept uh, in, the, in the future years. Uh, we want to create a, 
a support environment uh, to our, uh, our producers who are supporting. Though we want them to, uh, we wanted them to have complete a uh, certain level of education before getting involved in agriculture. Or with time, we found out that those people who, want, who, who had accumulated over five years of experiments were quite, uh, knows a lot, knows enough to get involved. We, we got involved with them also. Uh, for those who had only education, we, want, we, we asked them to add complete at least one year of, ex, of uh, experiment on the farm, similar to them, to, to, to the one they wanted to, to, to start. The idea behind that was we want them to, to understand what was the full year cycle of the farm. Many of them had only small experience uh, at the beginning of the season uh, on many years, but they didn't know that the full cycle was important to, to understand before starting a business. We focused on creating some also other uh, con considerations such as uh, we, we were supporting a business with at least $30,000 of uh, gross revenue a year. We wanted to have the young people to take over the business over a certain period of time. We didn't want to create only a permanent job, but we want to make place for the newcomers to take over the, the, the businesses. We wanted them, them to have at least 20% of the share. And there was a planning for them to take over the control of the company or the farm over a period of five years. We went up to 10 years so far, but uh, we, want, we want to have the picture how and when they'll be uh, the controller of the, uh, the, the farms. We opened this project to all kinds of entity, but uh, nonprofit. Uh, since it's a private business, uh, we want to, to encourage uh, private business at the end, private or cooperative business, though uh, that's the, that's a particularity we, we, we had to put uh, into the project. And the overall thing we asked them was to have a reasonable business plan, a reasonable business plan, which was uh, showing the perennity of this activity. Either it was a part-time or full-time activity, we want them to be able to show a reasonable uh, perspective of, su of success for the, for the project. So that's what, what that's what we ask at the beginning for the uh, for supporting a project. Uh, in their project, we wanted them to describe what they want to do, how they want to do it, their vision, their planning. We want them to make the full exercise to make sure that since we were putting money in this in a more risky situation, we want them to to make sure that they consider all the aspects of their project. So we ask them to foresee five years for in front of them uh, to better plan their project. And we were the first to ask all project to be supported by a coaching plan. By a coaching plan, we mean uh, we wanted them to have the reflection on themselves to find, their, find, out, find out their strengths as well as their weakness and they found out who could help them when it goes well as well as when it goes <laughs> bad to make sure that they can, they can come out of their experiment, their business project uh, in good situations. So this coaching plan, we are supporting them for doing it, but often we are leading them to find out people who could help them from the beginning, the beginning to uh, the evolution of it. On the financial aspect, uh, like I said, FIRA was there to bring additional funds where it was not available for them at the beginning. And to make sure that they could access to assets, even though they had, had not the, the basic or the minimum uh, cash down to put on it. So we create two projects. We can do loans. Uh, I'm sorry for the French title, the, uh, I couldn't have it translated, but uh, the loan is uh, essentially a sub debt or we call it in common language, uh, top down the cash down. And we have also the land or farm lease where we are uh, buying land and uh, leasing it after that. I'm describing those uh, quickly. By the way, all pictures in the backgrounds are uh, young people we supported so far. And you'll see most of them are smiling though. 
we are happy that uh, the outcome is so it is not so so bad so far. Loans, okay. Uh, down payments loan or the sub debt, like I was just saying, it's a loan which goes from fifty thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar. It adds up to the amount of money they can the, the the promoters can put in their project, and we will be considering all kind of money as well subsidies, cash down they've got already, assets they have completely paid and they own completely can be appraised and considered as a part of their payment in the project. And we'll be topping down all the values that can be, they can, they can put in their project. The very important thing about this uh, tool is that it's almost the only tool on the market that will uh, consider uh, the, uh, the money you, you, you're losing when you're starting, though I'm sorry, uh, I cannot translate the expression, but uh, the first loss you've got when you're starting a business can be considered in the whole business plan and will be able to top all the, uh, the needs of the project, even though it's to cover those lost in the beginning, as well as to buy assets and everything. So to make the old uh, frame of the uh, financial project, uh, this loan can ease uh, quite a lot the, uh, the challenge of uh, the financial issues. Where it's helpful also, it's that we do not consider the quality or the size or the, uh, the, the concept of the uh, object of the loan we can make an, an amortization of 10 to 15 years upfront without any other consideration with terms of five years, which enable the uh, promoters to better plan and to uh, ease reimbursement of the few years. To make it more attractive, uh, we also give a, a free ride for the three first year. So it can be either three, the three first years it can be uh, without any payments, we'll add interest on the amount for these three years, but they'll only start to pay back after three years on an amortization of 12 years then. So it is quite a lot, the beginning of the operations. As well, uh, we can do a five years, no, ca no, no capital payments, though they'll pay only uh, interest on it. It's a choice that we give the, uh, the promoters. For startup, normally they'll go with three years without payments. For transfer, since there's a, a business running already, they, they'll, they'll go for most of the most of the time they'll go for five years uh, without uh, principal payments. Qualification, like I said, we can match the same amount of money they're putting in the project and uh, make complete the the, uh, the financial montage. Sorry, uh, we base our, our uh, approval on the quality of the old project and the quality of the profile of the entrepreneurs we, we are meeting with. And the only thing at the end we, we will ask is, is not to, to see um, a full-time major big business. We'll ask to have a reasonable uh, perspective of success and perennial activity in agriculture. That's what we require from the project we, are do, we do analyze. By doing so, we gave the example to other institutions that it could create job, it could create business, and it, it's worth to support those projects, even though they do not compare to a full-time business uh, with mid-size mid or big-size business. Second uh, tool we're using, Having a loan is one thing. Having a loan uh, means that you have to put some cash into your project and eventually you can emancipate from it. But one of the major issue we've got with startups and transfer is when it comes to the time to make the cash down onto the land you have to buy. And it's where it consumed the most of the cash down or the capitalization uh, young people can put in their project. So by buying the land and renting it, leasing it to, to our, uh, our promoter, we can ease quite a lot the entry in agriculture of most of them. So we create this concept where FIRA can buy a land, can buy a land with some 
uh, buildings on it also, though even eventually what we call a farm, complete farm. The only, pro the only concept we have to keep in mind is that the building must not worth more than 25% of the whole uh, cost of the farm. And then we'll turn, down, we'll turn back and we'll lease it to the promoters uh, for a period of 15 years with an option of five years or up to 20 years. And during that period, they'll be uh, able to stop the, the lease at any time to buy back the land because they'll get the first option to buy it back. Uh, I'll tell you the, the concept on the buyback a uh, little, bit, little bit after. The fair, the fair uh, rent rate is compared to what is paid normally when you're renting a, a a uh, land in, in the same area. Um, other thing, uh, and quite important also, uh, we, are, we will not buy land everywhere in Quebec. We will buy a land which was identified by the promoters and presented to us by saying that this is this farm that I want to, to farm, not another one. And by the end, I want to buy it, but I can, since I cannot buy it right now, could you do it for, for us? That's, that's a concept going behind it. So fair rent, we plan already in the lease uh, the increase, which will be based on the uh, it is the consommation. I'm sorry I cannot translate it, but uh, relevant to the uh, the cost of life. And like I said, exclusive right of redemption to the uh, to the leaser. We have three choice of lease. First one we buy at the market price and we'll sell it when they'll be ready to buy it back at the market price, which will be determined by uh, an appraiser, will, will not determine the, uh, this price, it will be an independent one, will do it. The second concept we've been promoting also is uh, another offer where, especially in the area where the inflation uh, is very high and it goes quickly, uh, we offered to limit to three and a half percent the inflation yearly by the time the, the leaser are ready to buy it back. And if the price or the market price is lower, then they'll pay a lower price. But at the maximum, they'll pay uh, on the concept of three and a half percent a year maximum. And the last one we developed two years ago, uh, we will we will be sharing the plus value the the inflation or the plus value over the paid the, the price paid by Fira half and half, though it will ease the buyback, the, uh, the, uh, it will be easier for the, uh, the leaser to, to buy it back when they'll be ready because probably there'll be uh, a good value of exchange to uh, propose when they'll uh, negotiate their financial uh, loans. Benefit of this uh, lease, though it will avoid putting all their cash down onto the buy to buy the land. It will uh, maintain an exclusive right to buy it back, though their right on it will be preserved for 15 to 20 years. And it will ease their progressive establishment in agriculture. Though we consider that so far, it was a way to, uh, to help a lot uh, young people to start in agriculture. Little problem, like I said, FIRA is a laboratory. It goes only into Quebec so far. Uh, and I think it will remain in Quebec, will help other areas if they want to start it to uh, show and explain all the concept and how it works with us over the years, but it's still and remains in Quebec. Uh, loans up to 250 and farm lease with an exclusive purchase option. Uh, we found out that those two tools are pretty useful. Uh, especially added with the uh, concept of a, a, the, of coaching plan we are requiring from our people. And so far, success was quite good. Over 10 years, and I'll be concluding with the outcomes of uh, the, uh, the results of the, uh, this laboratory uh, of FIRA, the average loan we, uh, we, we've been allowing is over roughly around $120,000. So it means that roughly here, uh, young producers are able to manage to raise up to the same amount of money when they're starting, either with subsidies, cash, or assets they have proven to, uh, to own before the project. 
for the loans, for, for the, the leases, uh, the average price of land we are buying is roughly over $600,000. We bought some at uh, 150 and the, the most expensive one was at 3 million so far. But roughly, uh, let's say it's roughly $620,000 for the land. And these, we have start, we, we did start to sell it back uh, to some leaser uh, in the last two years. Who, well, after six years, the first one was able to buy back. <laughs> what I didn't say at the beginning, we want this project to be an impact project. We want to influence the others. We want to uh, consider certain aspect of doing a, doing a fund. Uh, we didn't have a major impact on a lot of things, but I can say that we started with only 26% of women uh, represented over the uh, owners of the, uh, the farms we're supporting. Today we're at 34 and the, the trend is that more and more women are taking their place. 40% uh, of the project were already supported over the 110 we did uh, have emancipated from, from Friera so far. And out of them, two thirds are uh, still in agriculture. One third have resigned for many reasons. Some, it was because of a problem with production, others with family problems. Uh, so many different problems happened in one third, in the third that had, didn't succeed. But um, almost none of them lost money by uh, getting out of agriculture. Uh, we've been involved in all sectors of activities. That was a problem 20, 10 years ago. Uh, institutions were not were investing only in dairy and uh, poultry and uh, um, large crops. Uh, when we were coming with uh, emergent uh, production, they were not there. On our side, we did uh, mostly uh, emergent uh, or new, 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 new sector of production as well as production like uh, sheep, goats, uh, cheese factory, which are not as uh, attractive for bankers that uh, the others are. We did invest everywhere in Quebec. Like I said, uh, financial solution were not available everywhere. We did a major effort to uh, invest as well in Gaspésie and Abitibi-Témiscamingue and, and in Lac Saint-Jean as we did in central Quebec. So after 10 years, uh, our goals are achieved. Uh, we succeed roughly everywhere. We had many surprises. Not as much uh, project uh, showed potential of success as we thought at the beginning, but I'd say that uh, today our impact was good enough that uh, all institutions are less lukewarm they used to be. Uh, there's plenty project and programs that have uh, been raising here and there in Quebec that support young people. And we see that small farms are now, are now much more supported than they used to be 10 years ago. I'll conclude with that though. Uh, if you get, you get questions, I'll be happy to participate in Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. That was that was incredible.